Amen. The Lord is coming, isn't he? Amen. Please remain standing and turn uh, with me in your Bibles to the uh, book of Romans, chapter 4. We, inver we are in verses 9 through 12. Romans chapter 4. I'm sorry, not 9 through 12, 9 through 17. 9 through 17. Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 17, and it reads this way. Paul writes, Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is also no violation. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is a father of us all. So we want to look at the scripture together and we want to see what scripture says about Abraham and his justification. Well, let's bow our heads and ask God to bless us as we study the word of God together. Father, what a joy it is to come together with your people, to come to share your word. Father, we thank you so much that when it comes to salvation, it is by your grace through faith in Christ alone. Father, if we had to earn and work to merit our salvation, Father, we could never do enough. For when it comes to salvation, it is priceless, it is a gift of God, not of works lest anybody should boast. So Father, I just pray and I ask you to make that so crystal clear to each one of us. And Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and strengthen us, O Lord. Strengthen us in the convictions of your word and bless us. And Father, we pray that you may change us. And now we ask your grace upon us. We ask for your blessing. I, I ask that you please allow me to be your messenger this morning, we ask all these things and we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And as you know, our topic has been the last couple of weeks, the topic has been justification. Justification. And the word justification has the word righteousness in it. And we learned that, that, uh, that when it comes to justification, that's a transaction that takes place, remember? It takes place when, when someone shared the gospel with you, someone came up to you, shared the gospel with you, shared with you that there is a holy God and that, and that we are sinners and we need God's forgiveness because we have broken God's perfect and holy commandments and that we need to repent and we need to trust in Christ. And the moment that you trusted in Christ as your Savior, something happened. Something happened. You became alive spiritually. Your sin was imputed on Christ on the cross. It was accredited to Christ on the cross, and the perfect righteousness of Christ was imputed into your account. In a sense, we say that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We are now declared righteous, even though we're guilty sinners. How can God do that? Because the price was paid, beloved. When Jesus died on the cross, his final words were, it is finished. And so Christ paid for our sins. 
And so we learned then that salvation, we have to understand, it's not only in the New Testament, but even in the Old Testament, people are saved by God's grace through faith alone and the coming Messiah. Now we look back at the cross. They look forward to the cross. So in chapter 4, uh, we learn that Paul is talking very specifically to a lot of Jewish men because you can see there's a lot of uh, things he talks about here regarding Abraham. Now, why is Abraham so important? Because Abraham, to the Jewish mindset, was the most righteous man on the earth to, in their mind. In fact, some rabbinic writers teach that Abraham even had some type of immaculate birth. You know, they, they thought Abraham had no sin. No, he was a sinner, all right. He came out of polytheism and to monotheism, didn't he? God called him out. And so Paul is now sharing with his Jewish brothers and sisters, along with the Gentiles, that Abraham was not saved by works, but by God's grace through faith. And so we saw this last time, didn't we? It's almost like, Pastor, why are you preaching this again? Because it's right here. We have to go through this again. <laughs> Abraham and his justification. And so we look at verses 9 through 12. You have your outlines right there. In verses 9 through 12, he talks about Abraham and circumcision. And then verses 13 to 15, Abraham and the law. And finally, verses 16 to 17, Abraham and God's grace. And so Paul is bringing out, is making this so crystal clear because there are people still during the time of Paul that believed that Abraham was justified, was declared righteous by his works, even by circumcision, even by keeping the law. And Paul says, you got it all wrong. And so, beloved, I want you to understand this. A lot of people believe even today. Isn't that true? Even today, they believe they're saved by being baptized. They're saved by if they participate in a certain ritual or rites or membership, somehow by some work that they are miraculously saved. No, beloved, it's by God's grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here. Look at verses 9 through 12. He wants to, and you have to understand what, what Paul is doing here. He's dropping bombshells on these people. He's completely obliterating their false belief in righteousness through works, righteousness through uh, the work of the law, and even here, righteousness through circumcision. Look at verses 9 through 12. So what Paul says now, after he mentioned what David said, Remember what David said, look at verse 6. He says, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the man whom God, see that word, credits, or the word can be used, imputes, right? Righteousness apart from what? From works. And David writes in Psalm 32, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. This is a person who's been forgiven and saved, not because of their own righteousness, but because of God's righteousness imputed or credited to them. And so he now begins to say, what about Abraham? Let's go back to Abraham. And remember the theme here is justification. How is a person declared righteous? He goes on to say in verse 9, another, a second bombshell has to do with circumcision. Another false belief is that when you're circumcised, you're, you're guaranteed a seat in heaven. They even taught falsely that Abraham sat at the gates of hell, and anybody that came to the gates of hell that was circumcised, that Abraham turned them back and they were able to go to heaven. Some false teaching they had. They really believed that salvation was by works, was by circumcision, and, and all these rituals and, and uh, keeping the law and all this, when that wasn't the purpose of the law or the commandments God gave. And so we learn here that Paul now drops a second bomb on them, and he tells them, if you're trusting in Abraham, and your works of the law, and you're trusting that because you're circumcised, you, you are shoo-in 
into heaven. What's another, what's another thing that the, the Jews believe? They believe that because of their genealogy, remember that? In Matthew chapter 3, they came to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, you know, just because you're children of Abraham doesn't mean you're going to heaven. He says, produce the fruit of repentance, he says. So let's look at verse 9. So Paul now drops his bomb on them. He says, is this blessing, in other words, this righteousness has been accredited to Abraham and to David, is this blessing then on the circumcised? In other words, only for Jews or on the uncircumcised, which are the Gentiles? For we say faith was accredited or accredited to Abraham or imputed to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. What is Paul saying? You know, Abraham was not even a Jew. Do you understand that? Where did the word Jew come from? It came from the tribe of Judah. It came after the Babylonian uh, exile. And when they came back, instead of being called children of Israel, they're called Jews. And, and so it's amazing that Abraham was not even a Jew. And when he was declared righteous, he was not even circumcised. The man was a pagan, right? He was an idolater. He was a polytheist. And the Lord called him. So you can tell the Jews, Abraham was not even a Jew. Oh, man, they, you, tell, you, you better be careful. You tell a, a, an Orthodox Jew that, they're going to punch you. <laughs> be careful. And yet they saw Abraham. He's the most righteous man. But do they realize that when Abraham got saved, he was not even a Jew? He wasn't even circumcised? He was like a, there were no Gentiles and Jews back then. And so that's what Paul's point is. Circumcision wasn't even a, it's a moot point. And so he says to them, well, how was he accredited righteousness? Well, he was circumcised? Nope. And of course, they believe that Abraham, by his works of the law and his circumcision, that made Abraham a righteous man. No, that's not what made him a righteous man. It was God's grace alone. Verse 11 and he, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. In other words, Abraham really was the man that stood out as the one who believed, uncircumcised, still a, a, a man that was a, considered a Gentile, and now he becomes the father of all who believe, both Jews and Gentiles. And this was God's promise to him. Go with me now to Genesis 17, would you? Let's go back. Let's do a little history here. So Paul takes the most righteous man in the eyes of every Jewish man as a sign of God's covenant, circumcision, and sets them apart from justification, the very opposite of what the rabbis taught. Genesis chapter 17, what was the purpose of this circumcision? It was a sign. It was a sign of the covenant God made with Abraham. Does that mean that that circumcision made him righteous? No. And we have to understand that, that when it comes to, to righteousness, first of all, we don't have our own righteousness. We need God's righteousness to be accredited to us. And that's what happened to Abraham. In Genesis 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God, and God accredited to him as righteousness. Now look at verse 17. This is now later on. They believe that Abraham was in his 80s here. Genesis 17 verse 1 says, Now when Abraham, or Abram back then, God changed his name to Abraham. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be 
blameless. I will establish my covenant between you, me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. So this has to do with Abraham's descendants. Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. Now what's another word for covenant? It's like a promise, isn't it? As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. He went from exalted father Abram to father of many. For I, I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. He's not just talking physical, but even spiritual. Verse 8, And I will give you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant. You and your descendants, this will be the nations, uh, nation of Israel, after you throughout their generations, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants. After you, every male among you shall be circumcised. There's a tearing of the flesh. There's a separation. It's a seal. It's a sign of God's covenant. Look at verse 12. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who is bought with money from a foreigner who is not of your descendants, a servant who is born in your house or who is bought with uh, your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people, for he has broken my covenant. And so we see here then that God made this, this covenant with Abraham. It was a physical covenant, and it was to, his, uh, to not only Abraham, but even his descendants after him. It was a sign, wasn't it? Now, the question is, did this covenant make uh, Abraham righteous? And the answer is no. If you're in Genesis, go back two chapters. We learn that God had already declared Abraham righteous way back before he had even any of his sons. And it says here that God told Abraham that he was going to bless him. Look at what it says here. Verse 4. Genesis 15, verse 4, Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man shall not be your heir, talking about Eliezer, his servant, but one who will come forth from your body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. This is a promise God gave to Abraham. And what did Abraham do with that promise? Verse 6, then he believed in the Lord, and there's that word reckoned or imputed or credited to him as righteousness. So how was Abraham saved? How was Abraham justified? By faith in God, right? And that's really important. And, and so, beloved, we, we learn that what Paul is doing here, he's dismantling the false beliefs that Abraham was made righteous by the works of the law. There was no law yet, right? There was no law yet. Moses came many years afterwards. And, and so it, God gave Abraham a promise. Specifically, we learn in Genesis chapter 12, he says, Through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And, of course, that could only be through a Savior, a Redeemer. Well, what about us, the church? Well, are we supposed to be circumcised then? Are we supposed to keep the law? Go with me to Acts 15. I'm glad you're asking those very important questions. <laughs> Acts chapter 15. 
what is uh, the church, the New Testament church, what are they supposed to do? Because that became an issue, didn't it? There was a time where Paul and Barnabas were up in Antioch and they were, the church was going great, people were getting saved and, and the church was growing and here come these guys called Judaizers and they, they came with some papers, supposedly they were important men from the church of Jerusalem and they said, you need to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. No, we're no longer under that covenant, are we? We are in the new covenant. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. We learned that Paul and Barnabas, they were so upset with this, they went down to Jerusalem to settle this matter. Remember this? And praise God, we have, the, we have it recorded right here. History. It says in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's false doctrine, isn't it? That's like a person says... Unless you do this, you can't be saved. Friend, salvation is by God's grace. God, Jesus Christ, he, the work is completed in Christ. We just, by God's grace, through faith, we trust in Christ. And so now they're coming down very emphatically saying, you got to be circumcised, you need to follow the customs of Moses, or you cannot be saved. Verse 2. And when Paul and Barnabas had a great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas had some others, and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through uh, Phonosia, Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. You see, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And when Paul preached Christ, he didn't preach circumcision. Paul did not preach baptism either. Paul preached the gospel. That's what he preached. Christ and him crucified, buried and resurrected. And, and so we learn here that, that when Paul was doing that, people were getting saved. But what happened? Verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, they're bringing some of their old religion in, who had believed, stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them. Who? These Gentiles. And to direct them to observe the law of Moses. That's the issue, isn't it? The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After the, there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. Remember Peter going to Cornelius' home? Mm -hmm. And God went to him, shared the gospel. You know what happened? The Holy Spirit came upon them. And they received the gospel. And they were saved. They were just like, it was, just, it was like a Gentile uh, Pentecost, you know? And these men got baptized. So Peter's saying, you remember what happened with me when I shared the gospel? These people got saved. Verse 8, and God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction, as before, right? God made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by what? By faith. Now, therefore... Why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Who can keep the law perfectly? Nobody. Why do you guys want to go backwards? You want to go back to the law of Moses? You want to go back to that? You don't want to do that, which goes, not only does it have to do with the uh, the, uh, the moral law, but the ceremonial laws and the sacrifices and even the civil laws. You want to go back to that. We're in a new covenant now. And so Paul, so Peter is saying, look, we're, we're not going back to that. Look at verse 11. But we believe that we are saved through what? 
Verse 11, through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And now the judgment is given. Verse 13. And you see, this was an issue in the early church. And it's been settled. It's settled right here. After they stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. By the way, this is Jesus' half-brother. This is not James, the son of Zebedee. James, the son of Zebedee, uh, was the first martyr. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. He is the author of the book of James. He was one of the leaders, uh, uh, elders in the church, probably the main elder. In verse 14, he says, Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after these things I will return, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, I will rebuild the ruins, I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all who, the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. What is, what is James really saying? In other words, James is saying it's always been God's plan that salvation will be for all the world. That's always been God's plan. See, God wanted to use Israel to be the light on the hill, to be uh, those that, that shared with the nations a true God. But Israel, instead of being the light, Israel wanted to be like all the other nations. Israel became corrupt. And so we learned that God always had the plan to bring salvation to all the world. You remember the book of Jonah? Were those Jewish people? No, they were Assyrians. And God sent Jonah to them. Why did Jonah run away and get swallowed up by a fish? He was disobedient to God. God sent him to, to Nineveh and to go and preach repentance to them. And so God, it's always been God's plan. And that's what James is, is, is uh, making it clear that it's always been his plan that the Gentiles will be a part of the sheepfold. Look at verse 19. Therefore, James says, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. Praise the Lord. And that we write to them that they abstain. There's a few rules here. And you can see a lot of these rules have to do with offending your Jewish brother. And that we write to them that they abstain from what? Things contaminated by idols because a lot of idolatry back then. What else? From fornication, that's sex outside of marriage, right? Immorality. And from what is strangled and from blood. And that has to do with not offending the Jewish brothers. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preached him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And how did it seem to everybody? Verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, uh, Judas called Barsabbas, and Silas leading men among the brethren, and they sent this letter to them. And basically, it's, they state the same thing. They're simply saying, you know, abstain from certain, you know, things that are contaminated by idols, from things, you know, strangled and by blood. I think that's kind of safe. You don't want to go and eat something that's not killed correctly. Uh, and from immorality. And so they're just simply saying that. So they're not saying for them, okay, you got to be circumcised and now you got to follow all the customs of Moses. When Paul shares that with the Jewish people, especially those Judaizers, it's, it's a bombshell to them because their faith was in the works of the law. Their faith is in circumcision. And so, beloved, we have to be really careful. We're not putting our faith in some type of ritual or rite or custom, but in Christ alone and him crucified. So the early church did not preach circumcision. Um. 
and it's important that we, we understand this, nor did they preach the law of Moses. Go with me to Galatians. We see that where the problems began there. Galatians, this is, this is the, uh, Galatians was, uh, was an area, and there are many churches in, in southern Galatia. And we learn that people that were called Judaizers, these people that were of the Pharisees, were trying to convince people to be circumcised and to follow the customs of, Mary, of, of Moses. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Paul is talking, trying to talk sense to these young believers. Some of them um, are listening to this false teaching. And uh, some of them are even getting circumcised and are even, they think that somehow they can add uh, to their salvation, that somehow by their good works, by the circumcision and following the custom of, Mer of, of, of Moses, plus believing in Christ, they will be saved. And Paul say, no, that's a different gospel, isn't it? In fact, Galatians, in the very beginning, Galatians says, you're believing a different gospel. That's not the gospel of Christ. Remember, the gospel of Christ is grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. So we see here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision... Christ will be of no benefit to you. Why? How does that make any sense? Because their faith is no longer in Christ alone. That's why. Their faith now, uh, they begin to put their faith in their circumcision and in their good works. When you start trusting in something else or someone else other than Christ, you're not saved. And so Paul is saying to them, if you get circumcised, then you're putting your faith somewhere else. Remember that the principles of grace is God is the one that has favor upon us, and we, by God's grace, we trust in Jesus. And so we learn here that, that Paul says, if you receive circumcision, Christ has no benefit to you. Look at verse 3. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Nobody can do that. It's an impossible task. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by what? By the law. Nobody, we just learned that no one can be justified by the law. But with the law is the knowledge of sin. But that's what these Judaizers are teaching. That you can be justified by the law. Therefore, you got to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. So we see that, that Paul is telling them, you have been severed from Christ. You are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. What does that mean? You know how a lot of people take this? They take it as you lost your salvation. That's not what Paul is saying. First of all, you don't lose your salvation. You cannot be unborn again. What Paul is saying to them is that the principles of grace you're no longer following. Your faith is no longer in Christ, but it's in the law and in circumcision. That person is not saved. So here are these young Christians trying to figure out, you know, what these Judaizers are saying. And, and they're saying, well, you know, you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's wonderful. But, you know, you need to add circumcision and you follow the law of Moses and then you'll be saved. No, beloved, it's Jesus plus nothing. So Paul is saying to them, look, if you're, not, if you're not trusting Christ alone. You're not saved. You're not saved. And that's what he's saying to them. They have fallen from the principles of grace. Salvation, beloved, is an act of God. Grace through faith. And so we see here then that Paul is making it very clear to them. Look, that's not the gospel I gave you. Go with me to Galatians 1. Galatians 1. That's another gospel. If a person is believing in a false gospel, that person was not saved. Let 
Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul is so disappointed, so hurt with these churches. Remember, it's, it's the Galatians, it's churches, not just one church. It's the area of Galatia. Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly, what? Deserting Christ. See that? That's him. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting Christ. How are they deserting Christ? They're putting their faith in the law. They're putting their faith in, in, in Moses and in circumcision. And so he says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Paul's saying, that's not the gospel I taught you. Look at verse 7. Which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And Paul goes on to say, for even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed and anathema. As we have said before, in case they didn't get it the first time, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be cursed. He's cursed by God. So, beloved, I want you to understand that they're teaching a different gospel. And even today, people believe that, you know, unless you, you, you do these certain things, you follow the certain ritual or there's certain rite or be baptized or, or you do so many things, right, for your salvation, that's, that's not the gospel of Christ. The word of God is very clear. For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Christ did it all, didn't he? I love that song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain, he has made me white as snow. It's by God's grace, God's undeserved favor. And, and so we learn then that even Paul himself says, I thought I, I, thought I was a righteous man, he says in, in, uh, to the Philippian church. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day, and I was a tribe of Benjamin, and man, I had all this faith in myself, in my flesh, and in the works of the law, and then I met Christ. And I realized it's all meant nothing. I gave it all up that I might gain Christ by faith. So when people put their trust in, in, in different things like the water or baptism or church membership or rites or rituals or sacraments, they're not trusting in Christ alone. They're trusting in something else. Let me ask you, what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in that your church membership? Are you trusting that somehow God will look at your good works versus your bad works? Friend, you do not want God to give you justice. We need mercy. Every man needs mercy because every man is a sinner. Go back with me now to Romans. And so we learn here then that, that Paul, again, I told you, he's dropping a bomb on them. Because they really thought by their circumcision and the works of the law and their genealogy, man, they were special. They're going to heaven even if they live like the devil. Some Christians are like that too, Right? Well, pastor, I said that little prayer, you know, I said a little prayer. Now I got my ticket to heaven and I can do whatever I want. And there's actually people that say, hey, I'm under grace. I can do this. I can still commit all these sins. But, you know, I'm under grace. I'm not under law. Yeah, but you know what? There's no repentance in your life. See, the, the genuine born again Christian loves the Lord. And they're not going to live a lifestyle of disobedience. So the evidence of genuine faith is obedience to the Lord. Um, and so we see here in the scripture that Paul just now dealt with their circumcision, which was, remember that this is very painful for these people hearing this. Second of all, Paul now deals with the law. We talked about it before, but he's going to deal with it again. Look at verse 13. He goes on to say, for the promise to Abraham 
or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. You see the distinction between the promise that God gives and the law. The promise that God gives is permanent, eternal. It's given by God himself. It's unilateral. In other words, it's coming from one party. The law was given to reveal our sin. The law has nothing to do with the promise. They're two separate things. And so Paul is making that clear. So the promise that, that God gave to Abraham, that he would be the heir of the world, was not through the law. But it was through faith, wasn't it? Look at verse 14. For if those who are of the law are heirs, in other words, if these people, by keeping the works of the law, are going to receive eternal life, then what's the reason why Christ had to die? If I can earn my salvation by keeping the law and being circumcised and, and, and being of the genealogy of Abraham, then why do I need a Savior? I can save myself. But see, that's not the case. Verse 14, for those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void. And the promise, it's nullified. If we are justified by the law, for the law brings about what? It brings about wrath. For heirs, uh, uh, for the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no violation or, or trespass. So the Lord brought in the law through Moses to show that, uh, first of all, to show them their sin and to help them as and when it came to obeying the law. Now, now they needed to remember that obeying the law was not a way to be saved, but it was an act of faith as you begin to obey the law. It was a way of them to exercise their faith in God. But no one can keep the law perfectly. And so we see here that, that Paul is saying that, that again, faith and the law are two different things here. Whenever you saw, like, for example, uh, Hannah and her husband, Elkanah, when they would go during the time of the judges, remember, they would go once a year and sacrifice. That was a time where, man, Israel was so apostate. Very few people went to the temple to go and to worship. But when Elkanah and, 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 uh, and Hannah would go, they were people of faith. Remember that the law was, was not, not, not only does it show us our sin, but it was through the law as they were fulfilling the rituals of the law, right? It was an act of faith on their part. It didn't save them, but it was a way for them to exercise their faith. And that's what the law did for them. And we learn through the scripture, as Paul writes, it was like a tutor. And, and so we see here that, that Paul is sharing that when it comes to Abraham, Abraham was not declared righteous through the circumcision, so also Abraham is not declared righteous by the works of the law. The promise made to Abraham is received by faith. If God's promise is earned through the law, then faith is unnecessary. And the promise becomes nullified. And so we see then that God spoke to Abraham. He says that through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And it said to Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. God's promise is to, uh, is one received by faith. And, uh, and so we saw that. And we saw that Abraham believed. Now, what does Paul say? Go with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. In regards to the law, go with me to Galatians, right before Ephesians. We need to understand the law is, does the law bad? Is the law sinful? Is it, you know, is, is it something that we should look upon as, as something that, that's, that's evil? No, not at all. You know what the law, it really just shows you God's standard. You know what God's standard is? Perfection. Anybody here Perfect. The law standard is perfection. And so when you look at the law, you're like, oh, have mercy. Have mercy. I, I can't do that. And it's like, exactly. You need a Savior. Galatians chapter 3, look at verse 6. 
Paul makes a very clear distinction here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 says this, Even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned or credited or imputed to him as righteousness. There, therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Isn't that interesting? The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of the faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So Abraham wasn't a Jew. He wasn't circumcised. But I like this. He was the believer, though. Really, the father of believers. Verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So it's a burden, isn't it? It's a burden. And uh, can you imagine having to go, you know, every, every time go to the temple, bring a lamb and have that sacrifice? It wasn't just once a year, by the way. Whenever you find out you're guilty of something, you got to take a lamb. Uh, you remember uh, Mary and Joseph after Mary had Jesus? Remember what they were taking to the temple? Two turtle doves. You know why they were taking turtle doves? They couldn't afford a lamb. So they took their poor, and they took turtle doves. What was a turtle dove for? It was a sin offering. You mean Mary needed a sin offering? Yeah, she needs a Savior too. So we have to understand this, that... That, um, that they would go to the temple often, and you know, I think it was burdensome. It was a yoke, wasn't it? Look at verse 11. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live, how? By faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law, ultimately? It's eternal death. It's not only physical death, it's eternal death. That's the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us. He bought us back, right? He ransomed us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Do you understand how that exchange works? Jesus became a curse for us on the tree. He took our sin and he clothes us in his righteousness. In verse 14, in order that in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive what? The law? That we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And you see, it has nothing to do with the law. It's by faith in Christ alone. Really, really important. So we learn then that, that uh, when it comes to, to the law, the law, really what the law reveals to man is a perfect, the perfect righteousness of God. And we can't, we can't fulfill that. Look at verse 15. Paul says, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law which came how many years? 430 years later. How can Abraham be justified by the law when the law came 430 years? Couldn't have been, right? The law came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. The promise is eternal. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. That's really important. When it comes to salvation, it's not a bilateral 
covenant. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not two parties in the sense that, that both of them are in agreement. God made this covenant and it was unilateral. God is based on God's perfect uh, character. When, when God made the covenant with Abraham, he took animals and he cut them in half. And it says that the Lord walked in between those, those animals. And who was it? It was God. It was supposed to be Abraham and God together. It was just God. So when it comes to salvation, it, it's all by God. This covenant was, was made by God. It was unilateral. And so we see here then that, that Paul is saying, look, when it comes to the law, the law came later. And, and why is Paul saying this? Because the, he's, he's dealing with the fallacies of, of the false rabbinic writings that Abraham was justified by the works of the law, that Abraham was justified and, and the circumcision proves that it was by his good works. No, it was by God's grace. Look at verse 19. So then why the law? What's the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of the mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is a law then contrary to the promises of God? No. Nothing touches the promises of God. They're, they're, they remain. May it never be, for if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. If we can be saved by the good works of the law, we don't need the promise. We don't need a, we don't need a crucified Savior. But it's not based on the law. Verse 22, but the scripture was shut up, uh, has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so we see here then that the law, by the way, we, the law is actually good. It's good. It shows us our sin. It shows us where we need to repent. Verse 23, I know I'm going long here, but. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by what? By faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So you see, again, the point is... The law always points to a savior because the law is perfect. And when you look at the law, you're so convicted and say, Lord, I can't keep this. I'm not perfect. I need, I need help. I need a savior. That's what the law does. It causes people to cry out for a savior. And it's the tutor that leads us to Christ. And so he says that, verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to to the promise. So you see where the promise and law are two different things? The law leads us, leads us to Christ. The promise remains that he's given to Abraham. And, uh, and ultimately the promise is not only will God bless Abraham, but it's a promise that all the families of the earth will be blessed, that his seed would he'd be the father of many nations by faith. Again, it's justification by faith. So go, let's go to Romans chapter 7, again, asking the question, is the law bad? Romans chapter 7. I think we saw this a couple of weeks ago. The law isn't bad, beloved. It's actually good. It's God's word. It's holy. It's righteous. But it also shows us where we fall short, doesn't it? Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Oh, 
Oh, that's not what I was looking at. Yes, thank you. I have one, I don't know why. Seven, seven. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. For I would have not known what about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Now you understand that, that even before the law, man still sinned, right? Adam still died. From, from Adam to Moses, people still died. They still had that curse of sin on them. But it wasn't really considered technically a trespass. You understand what I'm saying? Now, when Adam sinned, of course, he trespassed because God told him very specifically. Remember that a trespass is when, when it's very clear that God says you not, are not to do this, and then you still violate that. That's a trespass. That's even a greater sin. So during the time of Adam and Moses, there was still sin, but it wasn't uh, counted against them in the sense, in the same way as they are trespassing. But man still died. They still had the curse of sin on them. And so when the law came in, the law began to show them how many trespasses they had against them. And so Paul says, as soon as I found out about coveting, you know what happened to my flesh? They begin to trespass now against God. It's like a little kid, right? A little kid's running wild and, you, and he's doing whatever he wants. And then you, you put a sign on the grass, say, okay, son, I don't want you to step on that grass. I know you're playing, I'll lower that grass and you didn't think about it. But now I have a sign on that grass and it says, don't walk in the grass. All this time you've been doing wrong, but you didn't know about it. But now you have a sign and I'm telling you, and that little boy still will go on that grass. Now he's trespassing. When I used to deal with my children when they were little, I'll say, okay, I'm telling you, don't do this. If you do this, I'm going to spank you. And then I'll say, now tell me what I just told you. Okay, daddy, uh, if I do this, you're going to spank me. Okay, I just want to make sure you understand. So you can't say, daddy, I didn't know. But now you know, and this is daddy's law, right? You do that. Like Sandra one time was playing with the light, kept turning it on, but not on. <laughs> I, and I came home one day, and my wife says, I don't know how to do that, kid. I try to spank her, and uh, she's just not. I said, oh, no, you didn't spank her hard enough. You know, you got to take the diaper off. After that, it stopped. It was miraculous. <laughs> you know? And, and, and so you, you have to tell kids, and I, and I love that when they do that. They tell the kid, you know, not to do this, but when you tell the kid, now tell me what I just told you. Okay, if I go and do that, Daddy's going to discipline me. That's right. Now you know. So now when it happens, it's not going to be like, what a shocker, right? <laughs> You're not going to have an excuse. And so the law was given. But you know what? It's even more tempting for them, right? It's like, oh, and, and then when mom and dad are not in the house, what are they doing? I remember I was a bad boy. <laughs> when my mom and dad were not in the house, I'd be jumping on the couch from the arm and doing body flips. If I did that when my dad was there, oh boy. No, my, when my dad was in the house, it was almost like saluting him, like, okay, dad. But when dad was in the house, I remember he had his lazy boy and I had my foot on his lazy boy, one on the top and one on the, if my dad would have seen me do that, oh, I would have been a dead man, but. <laughs> Did I know I was doing wrong? Yeah. Was I having fun? Yeah. <laughs> that was. So when the law comes in, oh, now it's a trespass. And it's very clear. And, uh, and so uh, we learned then that Paul is making it very clear. Paul, Abraham was not justified by circumcision, contrary to what they have taught you. Abraham was not declared righteous because of the law. Again, contrary to what the rabbis have taught you. But finally, Abraham was justified 
through faith by God's grace. Go with me now to Romans 4, 16 and 17. For this reason, and I praise God is by his grace. Again, if we had to earn it, we would never have enough good works. Verse 16, for this reason, it is by faith. In order that it may be in accordance with grace, God's undeserved favor, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, which talking about the Jews, uh, the redeemed Jews, because they're the ones keeping the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is a father of us all. As is written, a father of many nations I made you in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Why is Paul bringing that out? To showing that he, God is almighty. The God who spoke creation into existence is able to redeem us and save us by faith alone. And, and so we see here then that that uh, uh, Paul again is making it clear that we're saved by faith it is, a, is a gift of God, isn't it? It's by grace. It's by grace that we are saved. You know that these last couple of weeks we've talked about different, different issues, different people. For example, we talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember that? The Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee was praying to himself, thanking God for all the wonderful things he was doing. He thought he was earning his justification. He thought he was earning his righteousness. While the tax collector came and with sorrow, he was talking to God, says, God, be merciful to me, literally propitiated for me, the sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. How's that? How did that man... Uh, go home justified. You know why? Because righteousness was imputed to him. Look at the thief on the cross. We talked about that last week, remember? The thief on the cross. Jesus dying on the cross. We see that the, the two thieves are beside him, and, and we see that the, uh, the Sanhedrin are badgering Jesus. If you are the Christ, take yourself, you know, save yourself. Others he can save. He can't save himself. And the soldiers and uh, and, and so one of the thieves, and I, I really believe this, I believe by the, by the mockery of the Sanhedrin, who's calling Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the King of Israel, that this thief was listening to them and realized, is that who that is? That's the Messiah, the Christ? I think that their mockery were a witness to him. And then he turns to Jesus. And what does it say? Remember me. And the King James says, Lord, remember me. We, we see that he just turns to Jesus. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What righteousness did that man have? Zero. And yet Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Wait a minute, wait. This man has been probably a criminal most of his life. And insurrections, maybe a murder if he was following Barabbas. What happened? There was an exchange, wasn't there? There was an exchange. The moment that he cried out to the Lord and put his faith in Jesus, the righteousness of Christ was applied to this man, and his sin was applied to Christ on the cross. And now this man is declared righteous, justified in the eyes of God. And when he died, he went to be with Christ. That's grace. Undeserved. Same thing with the prodigal son. Here's the man took his father's money, used it in loose living, comes back in rags, filthy, doesn't even deserve to be the man's son. But what does the father say? Put the sandals on his feet. Put the ring, that's the signet ring of a son on his hand and put the best robe on him. My son was dead, but now he's alive. It's God's grace. It's God's grace. Second Corinthians chapter five. 
Go with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. What happens when a person comes and trusts in Christ as Savior and Lord? Remember, it's Christ that saves. Faith is like the hand that comes out of the heart that receives that gift. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul put it very eloquently. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, sorry, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things pass away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, telling sinners that they need to be right with God. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's the gospel. Therefore, Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. Can you imagine when you're sharing the gospel, God is appealing through you? We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin. Jesus is God, perfect Lamb of God. He made him who knew no sin to be what? To be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, there's an exchange, isn't there? There's an exchange. And also our legal standing has changed and we are declared justified by faith in Jesus. So my question, beloved, is are you saved? Have you repented of your sin? Are you living to honor the Lord? The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you understand that you get wages? Now, some of you know this, right? You work and you get wages at the end. Of, they don't do this anymore. They used to pay you once a week. Remember those days? I think they go now once a month or every two weeks. Boy, I remember getting paid once a month. That was hard. You got to make that whole thing stretch, right? But it says here that the wages of sin, in other words, this is what we deserve. Every man deserves the wages of his sin, which is the wrath of God, which is the first and the second death. The second death is a lake of fire. Romans 3.23, as you all know, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody's in the same boat. Everybody is born a sinner. Only Christ was sinless. So let me ask you a question. Have you admitted? Have you ever admitted that you have sinned against God? Have you ever done that before the Lord? Did you know that's the first step? That's the first step of being a, a candidate for salvation. You get to admit that you have sinned against God. That's the first step, isn't it? We learn that because God is perfect and holy and righteous and just, he will judge sinners for their sin. They will receive their wages. God will condemn men and women for all eternity. They will spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's the unfortunate news. But what about you? You know, it's, it's amazing when you share the gospel with everybody, they're like, well, what about over here? And what about these people over here in this remote island? And just talk about you, just you, okay? <laughs> it's true. They want to go down this rabbit trail. Where are you going to spend eternity? Have you thought about that? The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's talking to the church there in Rome. Christ died for us. God, in his grace and mercy, as you know, he sent his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, around 2,000 years ago. Our Lord Jesus, he came and he died as a lamb of God. He died a substitutionary death on the cross. He was buried and he rose again the third day in power, declaring himself as the son of God. 
now, even, even today, right now, people can be saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus. Have you confessed Jesus as your Savior? Do you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead? Have you done that? I, I just want to encourage you to do that. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a prayer for salvation. Do you remember when you've done that? You might say, oh, Pastor, I've never done that. Friend, you need to do that. I remember talking to a young lady in college, and this was when I was in Wilmington. And uh, I had shared the gospel with her. She goes, I believe all that. I said, great. I can't remember her name. I said, great, I'm glad you believe all that. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever personally asked Christ to save you? She says, well, I've never done that. I said, why don't you do that now? Why don't we bow our heads and you just, you can, you can pray in your heart, or you can, but why don't you call on the name of the Lord? You know what happened? There was a change. See, she knew all the facts. And that's great you know all the facts, but you now need to apply that and you need to confess Christ and you need to call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to deliver you and save you need to repent and trust in Jesus. Have you done that? I encourage you to do that. Well, we're going to pray, and then we're going to have Steve and others come forward. We're going to get ready for the Lord's table as we think about the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered, who bled, and died for us was buried and rose again. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Lord, if we had to work for salvation, if we had to somehow uh, uh, try to earn it, dear Father, we could never earn it. If it's, our salvation was based on us, we would lose it. But we thank you that salvation is based upon your sovereign grace. That's why your word says, for by grace... We are saved through faith. So, Father, we ask now that you would help us and prepare our hearts, dear Father. We ask that you would bless this uh, bread and this cup that represents the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask your mercy upon us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be reading out of 1 Corinthians 11. As you know, our Lord Jesus, during the Passover meal, he turned the Passover into the Lord's table. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you can follow along with me. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth because they were abusing the Lord's table. Back then, it was a full-blown meal. Now we have with the bread and we have the cup. Paul writes to the church in Corinth and says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. And again, in remembrance. That's what this is. This is a memorial, but Jesus commands us that we are to do this in remembrance of him. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we're also making a proclamation by our actions. But there's a warning here. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. This, for this reason, if you have never trusted in Christ as your Savior, we ask, please refrain. This is for those who are redeemed. And if you are redeemed, would you make sure your heart is right with God? Would you bow your heads with me and in silent prayer, would you confess and make sure your heart is right with God that you may partake of the bread and of the cup 
and in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. Let's bow our heads in silent prayer and make sure our heart is right with God. Dear Father, who is worthy? Who is worthy to come into your perfect presence? Father, we know that if you should count our sins, we could not stand before you. But Lord, we come uh, putting our trust in the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. We come with faith in our Lord Jesus Christ who has died uh, for us and has, was buried and rose again. And now through Christ we stand. And because of Christ, we can come into your perfect and holy presence. We ask, Father, that you would bless the bread that represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord that gave himself and to pay the ransom price for our sins. We thank you that Jesus uh, took and, and, and paid the price we could never pay. And we ask your blessing upon this bread that represents his body. And we ask your blessing upon us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and separate your cups and uh, put the bread in your hand if you would. Paul writes that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together as one body in remembrance of what the Lord has done for us. Let's pray for the cup. Father, we want to thank you 
not only did Christ lay his life down and gave his body, the Bible says that Jesus said that no greater love has any man but to lay his life down for his friends. Our Lord Jesus showed us what true love is like. There is sacrifice. There was pain. But he did because he loved us. And we thank you, Lord, that he paid a price that we could never pay. We thank you, Lord, for the blood that was poured out that we may be saved and forgiven and cleansed and declared righteous when we know that we are guilty. Thank you, Father, for having mercy upon us. We ask your blessing upon this cup that represents his body. We pray that you may bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul writes in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim the Lord's death together. Father, we just want to thank you so much for loving us, for delivering us from the wrath to come. We ask, Father, that you would help us to truly appreciate what Christ has done for us, his agony on the cross, uh, his burial. We thank you, Father, that Christ conquered the grave. And now we just pray that you would uh, please continually guide us and bless us. And we thank you that we're able to remember what our Lord Jesus has done. We ask your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have a brother Steve come up now. Well, last Communion Sunday, folks, I messed up and didn't get this done. So, and I, and I promised pastor that it would never happen again. So, but I know that you never say never. So, but, <laughs> <laughs> but today uh, we're on top of it. So we have some birthdays coming up this week. We have Linda Duarte and we have Selena Ozuna. Where are you at, Selena? Right here. So, so amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Okay, if you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. And looks like everybody has one. So let's get started. Sunday evening, our pastor is preaching through the book of uh, Acts. It's going to be chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. The seven servants. So come out and join us, folks. Uh, Christmas cards. There's a little cubbyhole box in the in the break room. If you're so inclined to fill out a Christmas card and give it to your brothers and sisters, put them in there. And and uh, uh, people, folks, don't forget to go and check the cubbyhole. And make sure that uh, you don't have something there. And it will be there until Sunday, the third of January. Also, there's a list of people. And I don't think it's absolutely complete. But there's quite a few people on that list, so you can pick one of those up and see who's who comes to church, and you can address your Christmas cards to them. Praise and prayer meeting uh, start at 6:30 Wednesday night. Come out and join us. Our pastor preaches a short message, and we take devotional. Uh, we take praise and prayer uh, and write them down. Then we break up into groups and and pray over that list. So come out and join us. We need more prayer warriors, folks. Uh, Friday night Bible study, um, December the 11th, 6:30. Have some. Uh, a uh, little food and, and fellowship, and then we come in here at 7, and pastor has a Bible study. So all are welcome. Come and join us. Uh, budget input, if you have something to go in the budget, today is the last day to get that into Alan Obi, and his uh, <clears throat> email address is right there. So uh, email him if you have something to go in. And our next quarterly business meeting will be next Sunday, the 13th of December. It will start five minutes right after the morning service. So, folks, please stick around and see how we conduct God's business, and uh, you will be blessed by that. And if there's anything to go in the uh, uh, business agenda, just uh, get a hold of Karen Obi. She Her email is there also, no later than today also. Prayer request, lift up our church, our ministries, our pastor and his family. Replacing the trailers in the back, the parking lot, the financial needs of our church, our country, our military, our law enforcement, first responders, and the persecuted church. And I'll go back to the financial needs of our church. That because of the pandemic, our, our uh, <clears throat> ties are down. So uh, we ask that you pray about that. And however the Lord leads you, um, just uh, uh, please donate to the church. Uh, 
We're going to have a family Christmas night, the 23rd of it'll be Wednesday. There'll be finger foods, and we'll start at 6.30 to 7. And then we'll come in here and we'll sing some Christmas songs and have a Christmas story. So be here at 6.30 sharp so we can get started. Nursery workers are needed. If you're interested in participating in that ministry, you can see Rose Ozuna. And we also uh, would like to be able to help our brother Mario, who's going to Master Seminary. He wants to be a, a pastor like our, our pastor here. And uh, they go to Master's Theological Seminary. If you can donate to that cause, it would be greatly appreciated. We're also seeking volunteers to clean the church. If you're interested in participating in that ministry, uh, it's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And uh, you can see Miss Elizabeth, online giving. Get on your computers, follow the prompts, and you can donate to FCF. Also, I would like to thank all those who were participated in decorating our church for the holidays. Thank you very much, and uh, give them a hand, please. Hey, Pastor, it's up to you. You're next. I hope you all come out on the 23rd. Uh, it's Christmas Eve Eve, and um, instead of having our regular Wednesday night just prayer meeting, we're going to have family night. So bring finger foods, and then uh, we're going to read the Christmas story. We're going to sing hymns like crazy. We just want to rejoice in the birth of our Savior. So please come on out and join us. It'll be a blessing. Um, and I hope to see you there. Uh, please don't forget the people that need prayer, our dear brother Roy Ingram. Also, as some of you know, Graham. Graham uh, usually sits over here. He has also been down. And um, also, um, uh, Anthony, Sylvia's uh, son-in-law, needs God's grace. He's going through a lot with having seizures, so we want to pray for him as well. So please don't forget those, those folks. Uh, let me just uh, say this, and then we'll, we will pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much that we can come together. We can celebrate the birth of our, sa our Savior. But, Lord, that we can come together once a week. We ask that you would help us. Keep us safe, dear Father. Keep us healthy. Uh, Lord, we just want to be healthy so we can worship, so we can serve you. We ask for your mercy upon those who need grace, like Roy and, and Anthony, who needs grace, dear Father, that, that the doctors may find out what's going on with him, Lord, and that you may bring healing to him. We pray for Graham as well, Lord, who's been down and sick. And so we just pray for those in our congregation that need your grace. And now, Father, we ask that we may depart with your blessing. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. God bless you.